You know, I always say to people, when you pick your doctors, when you pick your saints around you, make sure they don't just look at a number, but listen to everything as a 360, which means how are you feeling? What are you doing? What are you eating? All the different things that just don't look like, oh, you're, if it's supposed to be between a two and a four, you're a 2.1. Oh, you're fine. You're within range. Well, a 2.1 is not really in range when you're trying to hit down the middle. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 334. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we are chatting with Molly Sims. She's recognized for her work as an actress, model, humanitarian, and author. Her blog and YouTube channel showcase beauty and fashion, health and wellness, fitness, motherhood, DIY projects, and more. In her free time, Molly enjoys hiking, yoga, and of course, spending time with her family. It was fabulous speaking to Molly. She is super sweet and so relatable. Even though she's connected to the Hollywood scene, she's very humble and very grounded, and we really, really loved talking to her today. She's had a really interesting journey with her health, her journey into motherhood, her career, and we're so excited for you to listen to this conversation. We can't wait to find out how much you love this conversation, and the best thing you can do for us is to share this episode or any of our other episodes with someone in your life. We just love getting the word out about Ultimate Health, and of course, we've got so many different episodes that can be shared, so thank you in advance for sharing our podcast. So let's get back to what we talk about with Molly. We get into how Molly grew up with a sense of tradition and community, her transition from studying politics to modeling, how going to an ashram made Molly mentally stronger, how pregnancy triggered the onset of Molly's autoimmune health issues and how she dealt with it, and lastly, be present, be kind, be happy. Really great episode with Molly. Super excited for you to hear this. Here we go with Molly Sims. Hi, Molly. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. I'm good. How are you? We're doing great. We're excited to chat with you, Molly. And to start off, I want to talk about how you grew up with a mom who was into fresh food and she was into cooking at home. And I'm just curious, was she the earliest inspiration for your current interest in health and wellness? I think so. I mean, my mom was one of six women. We're from Kentucky. She grew up on a farm. What they grew is what they ate. She was from the South, so it was very fresh. I would say organic at the time, as much as it could be. But yeah, I think for my mom, it was such an inspiration. I think she even took it, to be honest with you, one step farther because she would travel with my dad. They owned a book company and she would get to go all over to different colleges and universities. So she just was exposed to a lot and she would bring that information exposure back to the family. And she would have her prunes and her almonds and she'd be making her smoothie. Like she did this way before like it became trendy. You know what I mean? Even in her last few years, even though she's very sick now, she has taken care of herself from absolutely day one, which it's made a difference in my life because she taught me everything. But yes, for sure, she had a huge impact on me and my brother. And in the early years, did you resist that or were you into it? You know, my mom was always someone who was very healthy, but at the same time, she had no problems with her weight. So she'd be like, let's not have the Arby's sandwich with the frosty and the fries. She was really good. I didn't really resist that much. One great thing about my mom, she wasn't so like, you have to do this. You ha- It has to be this way. Like She definitely led by example as opposed to telling me what to do or what to eat. Eventually, like I pretty much embraced almost everything she did. And you mentioned the fact that your mom grew up on a farm. Was your grandma's farm around when you were a kid? Yes. We would go there. It was great. I mean, they had a pond with fish, they had a barn. They grew everything, tomatoes, cucumbers, peas. They would shell, make jam, I mean, homemade ice cream, everything. It was amazing. And how would you describe your childhood? My childhood was pretty idyllic. I mean, I was from Kentucky, a very small town, very family oriented, a beautiful community that a small town offers, a lot of support, a lot of women helping women, families helping families. I wish the education would have been a little bit better, but 
idyllic. I mean, I had, I can say I'm not in therapy over my family. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like my brother and I are very blessed to have the support and mom and dad that we did. And you grew up in a family with six other siblings, correct? My mom was one of six and my dad was one of two. You just have your brother. I just have my brother. Yeah. But my grandparents, my mom grew up on a farm and it was a beautiful thing because we'd go and visit, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather and all her sisters and brothers. And what we ate was from that farm. You know, they'd go and put it in bags and bring it back home. And we'd shell peas with my grandmother and my mother and they would make jams. They would make pies, all her sisters. It was just very familial, you know? And how has this carried over to your life today? I think it's carried over to my life today in the way that I love tradition. I love family. I love community. I love sitting around a table. I'm not going to lie. It's the one thing that at least one meal a day that my family does. We do the rose and the thorn, which is what was the best part of your day and what was the yuckiest part of your day or the not so great part of your day. I try to eat as healthy. I make smoothies. We look at a lot of almost all the ingredients. Like we really try to make it as organic and healthy and delicious as possible. Let's shift into your early teen years. You self-describe these as awkward. So take us back there. It was awkward to the sense that I was, you know, 5'10", almost 5'10", in eighth grade. So I was taller than the boys. I was taller than the girls. I had braces and it was some awkward years, you know, because I was so tall and that can put a lot of pressure on a girl when you don't want to stick out when you're 13 or 14 or you just like, that's your biggest fear. You know what I mean? What's very strange is that I was on set yesterday and I see a number come up, a 270 number, which means I know it's someone from Kentucky and it was a friend of mine. And I looked down, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope they're not telling me anything bad about my mom. And it actually was a big doctor in Kentucky that I love. And one of the patients that he was with was someone I went to high school with. I mean, I went to school elementary and part of middle school with Valerie Beck, but it was just so fun and sweet to talk to her and go back. And my childhood was idyllic, but it was awkward at the same time. And it just was, it was great, but it definitely was awkward. You want more than anything in those years to fit in. And when you're so tall, like going to prom, you're wearing flats. I just remember I'm like, mom, I'm not wearing a heel. And she's like, just wear like one centimeter, two centimeters just for your dress. I was like, nope, I'm not. I mean, I ended up doing it. So what eventually got you into modeling? Was it just being tall? Was there another in that you had? Was there a certain inspiration? I graduated from Murray High. I went to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I wanted to go into law, politics, You know, after a while, being so tall, people would say, oh, you should model. They would tell my mother. And my mom did a little bit in her own day. I had a friend while I was at school, and I had pictures taken with a guy named Rick Day, a photographer out of Memphis, who's phenomenal. And those pictures, he sent them to New York. And then I went and met them on my summer break between my freshman In sophomore year, I went to live in Washington, D.C. and did an internship in politics. And then after my sophomore year, I was going to spend some time abroad with Vanderbilt. And I ended up going up to New York during that summer. It was crazy. And they signed me and they were like, would you consider moving to Europe? And I was like, well, I'm already kind of going. So I wrote Vanderbilt. I still have the letter. I'm just going to take off one semester, just one semester. And I went there and I lived there pretty much almost for six years straight. And six years in your modeling career, after six years, you have an opportunity to meet with the people at Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. So how exciting was that for you at the time? You know, it was so excited. I loved Europe. I lived in London, Paris, England. I lived so many places, Germany. But I was ready to start coming more back home, back to New York. And I would always go back and forth, especially in the, the latter part of those years. But I was really excited. I mean, it was something that I, you know, I grew up, you know, I grew up with the legends, you know, watching them. And they said, you know, you're going to meet with Diane Smith and she's agreed to meet you. And even just for the meeting with her, I ended up going to We Care. And so that was like my first journey into like intermittent fasting and Alejandro Younger and like all of those things. And I met her and then she ended up booking me. And there you go. So just to break this period down a little bit more. Before you had the meeting with Sports Illustrated, you actually flew out to an ashram in California for seven days. 
what was the goal there and what was that like? That was really hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's called the ashram. It's in California. Did I do We Care first or I did the ashram first? I can't remember. I think it you was did the, the ashram, ashram first. It was 20 years in August that I went to We Care with my mom. What year are we? So 2019. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I flew and went to the ashram. It's funny. What's weird is that the girl that I was just making the smoothie project, a smoothie from her book, We Licious, Catherine McCord, she actually, she and I went together to the ashram. She's great, but it was hard. It was really hard. I don't mean to say that so bluntly, but it was mentally hard. It was physically hard. Not a lot of food. I remember wearing these red sweatsuits hiking 14, 16 miles a day, having to get massages because you were so tired. But I will tell you, coming out of that experience, there were CEOs, there were actresses, there were other finance people. It was an amazing group that I got to be with. And it made me mentally stronger. I'm like, okay, I can do this. I'm like, I had never done something like that in my life. And it was a struggle, but I did it. And I don't think I've ever been so proud of myself in my life. Was meditation part of this? Meditation was part of it because you basically meditated all day long while you're hiking. You know what I mean? Like you talked a little bit, but it was definitely your mental, I can do this. And then you start thinking about things and you get emotional. And my head went through the gamut on those hikes. And these days, do you have a formal meditation practice? You know, I have to be honest with you. Having three kids, a husband, a new dog, I don't have a lot of time to meditate, to be really honest with you. I sometimes only take two or three minutes every day. But yes, I close my eyes. I have my thing that I go through. Deep breathing, I really believe in. It just helps me get a little centered, especially when I'm upset about something. I don't get to meditate more than 10 minutes every day. Okay, so coming back to the story, you come back from the ashram and you get the job in Sports Illustrated. But before you go and do the shoot, you go to the fasting retreat. So let's talk about what that experience was like. You know this better than I do. That was actually easier. And I don't know, maybe because I had done the ashram, but that was actually easier for me. My mom went with me. I loved it. It was hard because we did the full seven days. But at the same time, like I got a lot of energy off of fasting, which I found so interesting. I never had that. I never knew that the less I eat, sometimes the more energy that I had. I learned a lot about colonics with a woman named Mary Kate and Elizabeth there. And, you know, the importance of colon therapy was really interesting. I learned a lot about probiotics and prebiotics and gut bacteria. And, you know, this was 20 years ago. It was just a really good intensive course into to wellness. I think it was really my first entry, but it was hard. I'm not going to lie. It was hard. I was back there recently. Some of the same people, my Susan, everyone's still there and still kicking. And what do you find is the hardest part for you? Is it physical or mental or both? You know what I'm going to actually say? It is mental and it's, you do have bouts of nausea, physicality of just being weak from no food, but it's so interesting how much energy you had. But the colonic started to take a little bit of a toll on me, you know, as you're taking so much out of you. I never realized that so much could come out after seven days. I know that sounds like TMI, but like it was interesting to see how much I had really tried to detoxify my colon. We did the liver cleanse with the olive oil and the lemon and I loved it. I will say I loved it. I have been a big fan for 20 years. I just sent four girls there. My old assistant just texted me and said, hey, I'm booked for We Care next week. And I have to say, like, it's a great thing. It just helps you mentally, too. You feel good. You feel good in your brain, in your cells, in your body. You feel clear. Is there weight loss? Yeah, for sure in the beginning. But it's more about what it does with your taste buds. If you're drinking too much alcohol or if you're smoking, it helps you get past that beginning of like, wait a second. It's like your taste buds change. I found that so interesting. So what is the protocol while you're away? Is it really just water or is it very limited food? Or are there different aspects that people can do depending on where you're at? No, there's one program. Um, Of course, they could supplement with like an avocado or a salad or something or a smoothie. But no, you drink teas and you have detox shakes and you get two cups of soup at the very end of the day. So no, there's no really food. It's crazy. I know it sounds so like, I'm probably not explaining it so well. You just have to go to see. It's crazy the energy that you can get off no food. But they give you a little bit of a smoothie, but it's mainly like teas. There's a liver kidney tea. There's a blood purifying tea. There's two detox drinks that are pretty disgusting that you have to 
drink twice a day. There is definitely like pills and regulators and all of that that goes along with your cleansing process. It's so important to go into these things with an open mindset and also to be supervised because I find that doing some cleanses and fasts and detoxes at home, people don't really have that same support that you probably have being on a retreat with other people. So it's really important, I think, to make sure that you're surrounded by people. Marnie, that is so important. And there's very specific rules. And before you go there that you can't just start doing that, you have to ease into it and they give you a full program. But most importantly, it's what you do after that can make you very sick. So anytime people do cleanses or detoxes or, you know, you have to be super important, check with your doctor and really make sure it's true and tried and tested. You know, I I mean that in every way. And listen, always customize something. If something feels off, I always say that. Don't do that. Tell someone or add something to it. No one cleanse or one detox is the same for everyone. And I know that intermittent fasting is a big part of your routine right now. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your experience with that and what that's been like for your health and your metabolism and any other benefits. Intermittent fasting, I've been doing it again since we care, since for 20 years off and on. It speeds up your metabolism. It gives you energy. I have moments and I guess sometimes I will plateau and of course I'll have a cheat day every week, but it just helps. I don't know how to explain it, but I guess the best way I can explain it is that it helps your metabolism. It gives you energy. Again, for me eating less, I have more energy. It's so weird. I always have this thing when I talk to my doctors, I'm like, why is it that when I eat, I always feel tired? And they said, that's your body working to break down the food. With intermittent fasting, it speeds up your metabolism. It helps with weight loss. It helps with cravings. It helps you follow more of a meal plan because you have windows, eight to eight, six to eight, 10 to one. It depends on what your window is good. And those windows can change, but I do believe in it a lot. I don't do it all the time. I will say I have periods where I will do it more or less depending on mainly my schedule and my life and my family and my work needs. I will say I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Molly to give a shout out to our show partner, Spruce. Spruce creates amazing products and one of their main products is grass-fed collagen. And they really go the lengths of sourcing really good quality collagen that is from pasture-raised and grass-finished USA cows. And they specifically have chosen this over Brazilian collagen suppliers, which is often used because of the concerns over cattle production and deforestation. So I like that they're really making sure to source something that's good quality and sustainable. And also their collagen is pesticide and antibiotic free. They've even gone above and beyond to test it for glyphosate residue and no detectable levels were found. So their collagen is amazing. It is so good for your skin, your hair, your joints, your bones, your gut health. And their collagen you can get as a plain product in a tub, but you can also find it in their bars and some of their other products as well. So go ahead and try out their grass-fed collagen. As a listener of our show, you get 20% off your first Spruce order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. And to get your discount, be sure and use the code spruce, T-U-H-P at checkout. And that is spelled S-P-R-O-O-S-T-U-H-P. Go and put your first collagen order in today and take advantage of this incredible discount. And now a shout out from other show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. One of my favorite products from beekeepers is their bee pollen. And this is a super bee food that is super tasty. It's high in B vitamins. It's high in minerals free amino acids, and it's just such a supportive food to build up your body and build up your immune system. It also gives you an amazing burst of energy if you just take it by the spoonful. But of course, you can add it to chia cereal. You can add it on top of grain-free toast. You can add it on top of a smoothie, and it's going to give you a little bit of a supercharge. So if you have yet to try bee pollen, I highly recommend you give it a go, and especially the one from Beekeepers Naturals. You can't go wrong. And as a listener of our show, you can try their whole lineup of products for 15% off by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. On top of that, if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. Over the years, I've really noticed that bee pollen can really differ from brand to brand when it comes to quality. And beekeepers definitely has the best quality bee pollen I've ever tried. You're going to love this stuff. Give it a try today. And now back to our chat with Molly. 
Talk about your transition from modeling to becoming a TV host. You know, that was an interesting transition, modeling to hosting. It started after Sports Illustrated. I got a few opportunities. I signed a five-year deal with CoverGirl. I started doing Old Navy, so I got speaking parts. And through that, I decided that I was going to take a class. August is pretty much dead in the modeling industry every year. So I took a class. I flew to LA and took an intensive acting class just to see if I would like it. And I did the Sanford Meisner technique, Sandy Meisner. After that month, I'm like, I think this is something that I would like to do. And so they were like, well, you can take the two-year course and I'm like, are you crazy? I live in Paris and New York. I can't do this. And they were like, well, why don't you just try? So I took about 77 red eyes over the course of two years. I graduated in May or the end of May. And a couple of months before I graduated, I had an agent through my modeling with Endeavor with Ari Emanuel. And they got an opportunity for me to do a guest on a pilot called Las Vegas. And they were like, it's just a reoccurring. It's just a guest role. Why don't you go out for it? So I auditioned and then I auditioned again and I auditioned again and I got it. And right before May, before the upfronts, before the pilot was shown, they said, we'd like to make you a series regular. I'm like, no way. I can't. I finally got to where I wanted to be. I'm working. I'm making money and all the loneliness and travel and it's going to pay off. And they were like, don't worry. It's never going to go. It's never going to get picked up. And, and I was like, okay. And anyway, five years later, I was on Vegas. But before that, while I was taking the show, I got opportunity to host a few things because I started doing commercials. So within trying to act and, and getting these great opportunities came hosting. I guess my biggest thing that propelled me from everything was once I got Sports Illustrated, I got an opportunity to do House of Style for MTV. And that was huge for me. I loved it. Bob Cusbit, who is a great producer to this day, they all found me and they were so great to me because House of Style was only on about four or five times a year after Cindy they were like, we really want to utilize you and see what we can do and try to make you better. And we feel like we can do that. We want you to sign on across the network. And so during this time of acting and taking the class and, or not really acting, but taking a class, I started hosting and I worked with MTV and it was great. It was like, actually, this was like still a little bit before the acting. This was right 99, 2000, 2001. So this was right before I started taking that class, but I was still taking the class when I was working with them. But I ended up doing like 50 something episodes of Mission Makeover, Say What Karaoke, TRL. I got to work with Carson. It's just, I met Vanessa Lachey, like so many people that I know to this day came out of that opportunity of House of Style. And that's really where my hosting kind of career came from. I learned off of cue cards. And I remember standing there with them, Chad Hines. He was like, okay, you're weaving and you're bobbing. You've got to just plant your feet. And they would practice. Hi, guys, I'm Molly Sims. And this is House of Style. As I look back on it now, it was, wow, it was such a learning period. And I have to say that growth of two, however many years I was with them, good Lord, has helped me today when I host, when I do things when I'm in front of people and it absolutely helps my acting career. So what happens next? What happens next? Let's see. After that, after House of Style, I end up taking the class, the Sanford Meisner class for two years. And then I end up auditioning for Las Vegas. And that becomes a full-time role on the show as Delinda Deline to playing the daughter of Jimmy Kahn and the girlfriend of Josh Demel. And I was on there for five years. I never stopped modeling. That was the one thing I could say, like a lot of girls, once they got to acting or hosting, they shun their modeling career. And I never did because I knew what it did for me, the opportunities that it gave me. And I'm still with Next Models to this day. I love them more than anything. Faith Catesley, Crystal, Joel Wilkenfeld, they became my other family. I continued to model, to host and to be on the show. And it was a busy, busy time, but it was a great time. And I loved ultimately being on the show. It took me a second because I was always such a gypsy traveling and leaving. And so that was a little bit weird to settle down and know that you're going to see the same people every day. I never saw the same people every day with modeling. It's always, you know, you're booked for two days or four days or a week, but you're never booked for five years, you know? Tell us the story of meeting your husband for the first time. And how old were you at the time? Meeting my husband for the first time. Well, I was playing pregnant on the last season of Las Vegas. 
And that kind of got me into, wait a second, I think I want to settle down. I don't want to be a gypsy. I ended up going to a fertility doctor. You know, they say like in your 30s, I don't know if you guys have heard this. They say like all of a sudden it can hit you at 20, it can hit you at 30, it can hit you at 40. But like you wake up one day and you're like, I'm ready. Like I woke up one day in my mid 30s, I think it was like 35 or 36. I'm like, I'm ready to have a family. I want this. What do you think triggered that for you? Playing pregnant. So you have this epiphany and then then what happens? And then I go see the fertility doctor, Dr. Gadir, Shaheen Gadir, who's fantastic. And we discuss, he was like, listen, you know, I think you should do it. I think you should freeze your eggs. More importantly, I think you should freeze your embryos. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not ready to do embryos, but I definitely want to think about doing my eggs. And a few months later, I ended up meeting my husband and he was great. I'd known him off and on in the business. He was an executive at Universal and he'd just gone off on his own to become a producer. He did a lot of different amazing movies. And so I'd always known him. I was always with someone. He was always with someone. And then I met him at the Golden Globes. Was the Golden Globes? I think it was the Golden Globes after party. My girlfriend wanted to get into the party. I was kind of at a place in my life where I was not happy in my personal relationship with my boyfriend at the time. It was a hard year because I need to make some big changes. I met him and we uh, we talked. My husband's really good at making people think like, it's good. Everything is great. And and I'm normally that person too. I'm super positive. Like your show can be canceling. You can have no money. I'm like, things are great. You know, that's also Hollywood. It was like, how are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm honestly, I'm not good. You know, I've got some sorts of things out. I was like, how are you? And he was like, oh, work is good. I'm just, it's okay. And he just was so normal. And so my agents were like, I said, you know, if you have anything, let me know. He says, listen, I do have a lot going on. I'm filming and he was filming, I think, in Scotland at the time. He just finished the breakup and then he called and I don't normally do meetings or drinks with producers at the time, especially late, but I had a moment. He was like, oh, Scott Super wants to meet you. And I was like, okay. And, but it was a great meeting and we had dinner and it was right around the corner at the Chateau Mormont from my house. And then about two or three weeks later, my agents were like, you know, he's no longer with that person. I was like, really? And then he emails me and he's like, listen, you know, I'd love to talk more. I hope you're well. I just want you to know what we were talking about, like picking a lane. He goes, I picked my lane. And and then he asked me out for almost a year after that. I was like, you got to get yourself together. And I certainly am in no need, no position to date because I was just trying to get out of something. I was getting out of something at the time. A year later, he called and I was like, you have asked me out so many times. And actually, one time I'd actually emailed him back and he did not email me back. I'm like, well, that's weird. All girls like a little bit of a chase. Anyway, something had happened, like he lost his phone or like he lost all of his numbers, which was true. I always thought it was a lie. It was actually true. He said something with his system. He was really cute. He goes, just one drink. I'm like, oh my God, you've asked me out so many times. Like you deserve to have dinner. And so we had dinner and that was basically it. And then what happened on your honeymoon? And so we dated for two years and on my honeymoon, we ended up getting pregnant. So we were married like, I think three days, <laughs> which is crazy. And then nine months later, we had Brooke Stuber. And tell us about your experience with this pregnancy. I know that this was interesting because it triggered some health issues for you. Yes. And I am someone living with Hashimoto's. Oh, you do? Oh, I'm so sorry, Marnie. <laughs> it is so hard. It's so, I got diagnosed. I had a very difficult pregnancy. At 22 weeks, I was diagnosed with velamentous cord insertion, basically meaning that the baby was not connected to me great. Even before that, at 13 weeks, when I did a CVS, because I was so old at the time, and there wasn't the maternity 21 test that there is now the blood test. And I got talked into the CVS and they said that, you know, the stomach is outside of the body. And there just was like, it just was very emotional, anxious. Everything absolutely worked out. But I started about seven months after getting pregnant. I started an immense amount of weight gain. Like I probably gained, I can't even tell you how much I gained. I mean, that total was like 80 something pounds. I have a picture of the scale. My feet, I looked like I had elephantitis. My hands, I ended up getting carpal tunnel syndrome from a pinched nerve. Like it was like that feeling where like my hands, my fingers would go numb. My neck was swollen. It ultimately was an autoimmune. It was a thyroid issue. It was hypothyroidism. And you had no predisposed nothing, insight to this before nothing, pregnancy. Nothing, nothing, nothing before pregnancy. So it's totally onset from pregnancy, which can happen. 
Listen, I'm sure people thought I was binging or, you know, I hadn't been able to eat because I was in a very stressful modeling, you know, the world of modeling and entertainment and acting. I'm sure people were like, just, oh, well, she's enjoying herself. You know what I mean? Like, but my mom, I was about to give birth and she came and I went to New York when I was really late. My friends were like, are you okay? I just like was so swollen. But again, I didn't know I had it. So you delivered late is what you're saying? No, I delivered on time. But once I delivered, they still didn't figure out that I had it. Right. They kept telling me, oh, it's just postpartum. You're just tired. Don't worry. You'll lose the weight. Start eating a little more. Start working out after your six to eight weeks, your C-section. Like, And so I did. I did just that. I breastfed as much as I could. I had a very difficult time with that. I do not make a lot of milk. My little boy was born with a tooth. It was a very painful. I wanted to breastfeed so bad that I wore a bottle around my neck. I thought everyone made me feel like formula was poison. It was awful. It was a very difficult time. And then I kept saying I didn't feel well. The weight's not coming off. Something is wrong. And then I walked into my doctor's because you're always used to seeing an OB. And so I walked back into my GP and he was like, something's wrong with you. He's like, you look like a linebacker. I'm like, my neck is swollen. Everything is swollen. And from that moment on, it was go time. Ultrasound, biopsy. They called me. I remember pulling off of the 405 being like, you have goiters in your neck. It was like a whole thing. But I was so happy, Marnie, because someone believed me. It was something was wrong with me. And I know that sounds crazy to be so desperate. I was so desperate. I was 120 something pounds when I got married September 24th and June 19th, I was 201. So it's not so much about the weight. It's just that you have to get the weight off. You like, even though you get diagnosed finally, you still have to have that journey of getting it off. And thyroid conditions are so underdiagnosed and so misdiagnosed. And you do sometimes feel like, you know, the doctor just doesn't understand what you're going through until you finally get to the right result. So when you found that diagnosis and when you got, you know, the diagnosis that there is something going on, what were the next steps? What did you start doing to lose weight, feel like Molly again? What did that look like? When I first got diagnosed, I did the ultrasounds. I ended up doing the biopsy. It got diagnosed as you don't have thyroid cancer, but you have an underactive thyroid. And that is causing you to be extremely tired. That is causing weight gain. I met with an amazing doctor. I still work with him today, Dr. Jordan Geller. He's an incredible endocrinologist. You know, I always say to people, when you pick your doctors, when you pick your saints around you, make sure they don't just look at a number, but listen to everything as a 360, which means how are you feeling? What are you doing? What are you eating? All the different things that just don't look like, oh, you're if it's supposed to be between a two and a four, you're a 2.1. Oh, you're fine. You're within range. Well, a 2.1 is not really in range when you're trying to hit down the middle. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. It's very hard when numbers are, especially TSH, which is the most common one that doctors use, mm-hmm. it doesn't give the whole picture of what's going on with the thyroid gland. It's so important to get more tests done. And also, as you said, to also talk about what's going on, how you're feeling, what are the, th- the symptoms you're experiencing day to day, because that's going to put together the whole puzzle of how you're feeling. Totally. And also, you know, he was the type of doctor where there's nature thoid, the weight from pig, I think. There's synthoid, like there's cytomel. There, there's so many different things. He ended up putting me on nature thoid because I wasn't getting pregnant. I don't know. We ended up switching to synthoid because I think it was more tested at the time than nature thoid. When you're pregnant, you have to make sure that your levels can't be too low, right. I think. So you were trying to get pregnant for your second child? After I lost all the weight. Okay. I mean, that took me 16 months. So of course, once you yeah. – I was so pathetic. Like once I had finally worked 16 months to lose all of it and start to feel better, I was back. I had to start – I was so old. You know what I mean? I had to start. I put it off as long as I could to try to feel better and feel better mentally and physically. And But it was a very difficult time in my life because I just felt lost. I felt like I had a newborn. I – was sick. I didn't feel good. And I love this baby more than anything. I had people always say like, you never know. You just never know how much you're going to love something. You can't imagine until, until it's there. So you're going through this health challenge and trying to figure out what's going on. At the time, do you have a great support system in place? I had a support system. I always ha- I have an amazing group of women that I have worked hard. I have deposited into the bank, my girlfriends. I've spent time. That was the one thing with being a gypsy and traveling. I'm being gone all the time and missing birthdays and weddings and funerals and so many things that once I came off the road, I really dedicated to have that amazing group. They were absolutely supported. 
I wasn't used to having an autoimmune issue. It was more about me. I had it. My husband was amazing. My doctors were incredible, but I, I don't know. I just felt lonely. I have to be honest with you. I felt I didn't look good. I didn't feel good. And not that looking good should matter, but it did to me. There I was at my top of my game, marrying my prince nine months before. And I just, I felt awful, but I did. I had support. Absolutely. But it just was a journey. And I don't, I don't love the word journey, but it was a definite path that I had to be on. And it took me a while to get the medicine right, to feel better, to have energy again, you know, take away that you just had a baby. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Molly to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. If you want insurance that you're getting your greens in during the day, you've got to get the green juice powder. If you have this in the morning, then you know that at least you're ahead of the game. And from there, you can still have your salad, sauteed greens, green smoothie. As when it comes to greens, the more the better. There is no such thing as too many greens. But there certainly is such thing as not getting enough greens. So at least if you get this green juice powder in, you are covering your bases. It's got a variety of different green superfoods in there. It's got some adaptogens. And the taste is great. All you need to do is add water, bring it with you on the go, or just sip it right when you wake up in the morning. Get hydrated and give these greens a chance. I love the green juice powder, and I know you will too. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Organifi order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O R G A N. IFI. Get your greens on today with the Organifi Green Juice Powder. The quality of this product is second to none. And now a shout out from our brand new show partner, Primal Life Organics. And this is a product line that was created by Trina Felber, who was actually on our show back on episode 304. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, I highly encourage you to go back and listen. And what this line offers is a variety of different clean, non toxic products from oral care to skincare and body care. And this is the primary product line that Jesse and I are using right now on our skin. We are using the Bare Cleanser, the Blue Serum, the Bare Moisturizer, and it's been making our skin look and feel so good as the products are so rich and based on natural ingredients that your body can actually absorb. You can actually eat them and that's the way skincare should be. And I'm also using the toothpaste, which is clay-based, and the gum serum, And my teeth have never felt so good and my gums have never been so healthy. And one of Jesse's favorite products is the deodorant. And finally, he found a natural deodorant that works. Yes, I went years trying so many different natural deodorants. And Trina's deodorant is incredible. I've been using it for, I would say, about a year and a half now. And I love it. It's the best one I've ever found. And I love the whole lineup of Primal Life Organics products. And I know you will too. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash primal. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash primal. When it comes to clean beauty products, there's a lot of companies out there making quote unquote clean products, but a lot of them are only going part way. And one thing about Trina's products are the ingredients are super legit, super clean, and you're going to feel great using them. Go and give Primal Life Organics a try today. And now back to our chat with Molly. So you're on the journey to try for your second. And how old were you at the time? You kept saying so old, but let's give a context of what quote unquote so old was. My second, I think I got pregnant 37, 38. And just to give you context. So I'm 46. So he was born in 2012. How old was I? I don't even know how old I was. 37. And then Scarlet, so it'd be early 40s. Which is common these days. You know, people are getting pregnant right, later I understand and later. That, Arnie, but it wasn't common seven years ago as much, is what I'm saying. So, no, no, exactly. They don't look at you as young when you're 39 or 40 trying to have a baby. I love you, but I. <laughs> well, still, it's still considered a risk factor, quote unquote. Like, I'm 32 weeks pregnant right now, and I'm. Oh, you are? I am. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. It's your first? It is. It's our first. Oh. So we're super excited. And yeah, I'm 38 years old. But it's funny, like I have had a very healthy pregnancy and I feel like this is kind of the norm for a lot of my peers. 
But it is funny because when you read certain books or you do talk to certain doctors or practitioners, it's still, quote unquote, a risk factor any age over 35. So it's interesting how we're told that, but you don't necessarily have to feel that way. Totally. Oh my gosh. Like I was like, I'm doing this. I am not like geriatric is what you're calling me. But you know, you do have to do all the extra scans. I'm sure you do too as well now. It just was a very big thing to me that people my age had kids in high school. Right. You understand? So I think now it's so much more embraced. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, I'm 46 years old and I have a two and a half year old. Yeah, I had scarlet and that took a second. I did a couple of rounds of IVF that did not work. I freaked myself out. And then I settled down and relaxed and prayed and I had Miss Scar and she's amazing and so fun. and. I couldn't believe that it, they called me and they said I was having a girl. Do you know what you're having, Marnie? We don't. It's it's getting a little intense now that we're getting closer, but we opted not to find out. <laughs> How many weeks are you? I'm 32. You're 32, so you're getting there. I'm getting there. We're getting close. So it's exciting and it's nerve-wracking. Can I tell you, it's everything. It's magical. Yeah. You know, I had a very tricky time, like Hashimoto's, as you know, but at least you know that. That's what's so much mm-hmm. better. Like. Just the knowing, like once you know something, you can handle anything. Well, that's a big part of it is that I knew for the last number of years. So I've done a lot of groundwork to get my body in a good place. So great. And it's so great for your pregnancy, for holding your pregnancy, for getting pregnant. I mean, it really is like, it's real. Autoimmune. I work with an amazing woman here named Susan Baker out of Los Angeles, California, and she specializes in autoimmune and rheumatoid. And it's incredible, the body. And and it's incredible. It's what you said that some people, they don't believe them, but they're not well. Molly, as two people that are going to become parents very, very soon, what would you say from your experience is something you wish you knew when you were about to have your first child? Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. Babies are so tough. I remember like trying to hold him and like trying to give him his first bath, like my hands literally shaking because I'm like, oh my God, you're so small. Take a deep breath, enjoy it, relax. Everything's going to work out. You're not going to starve your baby. Formula is not poison. (laughs) I just was so nervous because I love this little piece of magic more than anything in this world. Oh my God, I'm so happy for you, but everything is going to work out. And remember your birth plan, you may have the best of plans. But sometimes those plans aren't supposed to happen and let it go. You know, that's the best advice. You know, don't hold on to something. If your doctor recommends something, do it. Listen to your gut. I think that's probably the best advice I can give you. You will have a mom gut. You have it. You have it now for your own being, but you will have it. And if you feel something as a mother is not right in your body, with your child, with your husband, go on that gut. Go on that gut. I'm telling you, because that is. It's powerful. People have said to me, doctors have said to me, like, I don't know, it's fine, it's fine. I'm like, nope, I, I, uh, uh-uh. I, something's wrong with him or her, or I don't, I don't quite trust the situation. And that, believe in your gut as a parent, as a mom, as a new mom. Love it, beautiful, and yeah, you'll get better with it on the third. <laughs> you know, like what I did on the third is not what I did on the first. I remember saying, like, oh my god, why are those kids on the floor? I would never let my kid get on the floor of an airport. Ugh. You know, on the third, it's like he's licking the pole. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) but you know, the third, I say, getting your immunity. Yeah. But it's an amazing experience and it's an amazing journey. Kids have taught me so much. Kids have taught me to be less selfish. Kids have taught me to, once I entered into motherhood, the way I eat, the way my family eats, the way we go about our products in our house, it really changed me. It changed me in a lot of different ways. So let's get into that. I want to get into what you eat. We talked a little bit about your experience with fasting, but let's talk about your diet and how it's evolved over the years. I know you've tried on different yeah. diets. You've been vegan. You've tried raw. But tell us where you're at. I've tried microbiotic. <laughs> I've tried the South Beach diet. I had the cranberry diet, the grapefruit diet. Like I did everything to be a model, to be in the entertainment business, but more so a model like an athlete. You have to be a certain weight, especially at that time. So it was always a struggle. I will say that. Marnie, it was always a struggle for me. I was naturally never going to be a zero or two, just naturally. So after years of trying to find what works, I think the biggest difference is that before I was trying to be skinny. And now as a mom, I'm trying to be healthy. And they're very different. That's what I personally, why I wanted to do this podcast is that's what I love to talk about. 
I have done vegan and microbiotic and all the different kinds of things. And I've been willing to try different things. Intermittent fasting, a long time, it was protein and vegetables. Then it was no dairy. Then it was no gluten. I've literally tried everything. Recently, this year, I don't know, I guess I was 45. I woke up and something wasn't working. My exercise, my dance exercise circuit, it just wasn't working. The Tracy Anderson, it wasn't working. Maybe I'd just done it for too long, but I was spending hours. And again, it was too long. My diet, I'd plateaued. Like I wasn't losing weight. I was still doing the same things that I'd done all these years, basically, but something wasn't working. And I decided to do a colonoscopy because A very good friend of mine had a situation and the recommended starting at 45. I'd gone to We Care. And so all of these different things, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, and I had already started to cut meat out with my family, like a meatless Monday, Taco Tuesday, like pick, okay, if you're going to have your meat on Taco Tuesday, let's go meatless Monday. You know what I mean? Let's try one day. I'd already started trying to limit our family's meat intake because I had to do all the things with the colonoscopy to prepare for that. Then I had to prepare for We Care. I was just like, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to eat a lot of animal products. You know, I I haven't eaten dairy in a long time. I mean, I eat a little bit, of course, but really I took dairy out a while ago. I really started noticing a huge difference in my energy, in my weight loss. I started doing high intensity uh, interval training, which for me, that's like saying, you're going to make a formal model do weights. Are you out of your mind? Like I'm the girl in the back of the soul cycle. I'm never going to pick up those two pounds of weight because it's going to make me bulky and big. So I went against the grain on everything. I ate turkey, steak, ham, everything, fish. And I turned everything upside down, stopped eating meat. I started eating a ton of fish. With my workouts, I did that. I kept a little bit of the dancing, but more like dancing that was like full body. So more of like high intensity, even dancing. I do this thing called dance body, which I found. And it's wonderful because it's really using the whole body. You're not just like dancing to dance. You're wearing weights. I ended up dropping like 16 pounds. That has been my journey this year. My journey with that, still doing the circuit, the HIIT training. I'm still doing the dancing. Unfortunately... (laughs) Marnie and Jesse. I'm a really good rule follower. So by cutting out meat, I started eating fish. Well, I haven't been feeling well lately. So I did a blood test and I have really high levels of mercury. (laughs) So I have to kind of now eat less fish and less tuna. So I've added a little bit of meat back in, but not a lot, but I feel good. I do. I just didn't really want to get mercury poisoning. (laughs) Otherwise, is the focus of your diet just on a lot of vegetables and good quality fats? And- exactly. Healthy avocado, healthy fats, a lot of vegetables. That took me a while. I will say like that was really hard for me to try to get enough protein in my diet without feeling like I was weak or I'm tired, like to getting the protein that I needed without getting it from me and animal products. I think all things are good for different times, whether it be microbiotic, whether it be keto, whether it be fasting, it has to work for you. I always recommend people to try things. Just try it. You know, you never know. I mean, if you would have told me that I would be lifting weights and not eating meat in 2018, I would have called you crazy. But yet here I am. Molly, I know we're getting tight on time here, but one last thing I want to get into is something you talk about in your book, and that's when you got caught up in your career, and that was where all your focus was for most of your years, and eventually you realize you're actually neglecting your personal goal. So how old were you at the time, and what sparked that epiphany? I was 35 or 36. I think wanting a family really sparked that epiphany. It really did. I wanted to settle down. I loved my life. You know, I'm one of these girls. I've really never been one to have FOMO. I I really never have. I didn't want to miss out on having a family. And I wanted to have roots. And I wanted to have friends that I could see and I could be relied on and they could rely on me. And I had to make that decision to really focus on my personal life, not professional life. Like I couldn't just jet off to New York or to Paris or to London for a job. I had to date, be here be present. I was in a grocery store and I walked by and Heidi Klum, who I love, was on the cover of a magazine. And I was jealous. I mean, she's gorgeous. I'm always jealous of how she looks, but I wasn't jealous about how she looks. I was jealous because she was married and had four kids. And that was my epiphany. And I wanted to be like her. You know, I wanted to have a great career, but a great family. That's where I set these goals. And I I really mean that. I talk to young women a lot. I'm like, what do you want? What's your path? 
my uncle was a preacher for many years. And I would say at that time, well, Uncle Leslie, it's, it's what's meant to be is meant to be. And he goes, not really. He goes, that's just something you tell yourself to make yourself feel better. What's meant to be is not meant to be. What's meant to be is from the choices that you put in place to make what you want happen. That's how I go back to meeting my husband. It's like, I picked a lane. I didn't want to be the single girl anymore. I wanted a family. I wanted a life. At the end of the day, fame isn't real. Not real. And it's passing and it's fleeting. So many women miss that opportunity and men. But for me, I would not have been happy had I not... I, as happy. I can't imagine my life without my family now. Well, Molly, I'm just so happy for you. You had the amazing career. You still do. Thank you. And you ended up with the family of your dreams and everything just came together. So I'm so happy you had that epiphany when you did. Thank you. And to wrap up here, our final question for you is what does ultimate health mean to you? Ultimate health means feeling good inside and out. Get your glow on, get your glow inside, get your glow outside, strive for whatever it is you want. Be present, be kind, be happy, you know, and those are very hard bees to be, but try. I think everyone deserves to live their best life. I know that health and wellness has really transformed myself and my family and I keep striving to do better and to feel better and to eat better and to work out better. And that's ultimate health. That's being the best you can be. Beautiful. And where's the best place that we can send our listeners to check out everything that you're up to and what you're doing? You can find me on Instagram at Molly B. Sims. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me at mollysims.com. You know, I'm very truthful with my readers, with my friends, and with all the people and my fans about what I do and what I use and how. And I really do love it. You know, I really love finding things out and giving information back. Like, I truly, like, I love it. I try to do my best and I, I try to be honest in what I do. Well, you're very passionate. You're very down to earth. And that definitely comes through in your social feed. So we'll definitely link everything Thank up in you. our show notes. Marnie, congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> we're so excited. We really are. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we're just in that final stretch where we're nesting, get everything ready, and we just... So when you start to nest and when you start to go crazy on organization, it's because you're pregnant. Yeah. (laughs) It's okay. We got nowhere else to be right now. It's the perfect time actually to hunker down, so it's great. Molly, thank you so much for coming on the show. I had a lot of fun chatting with you, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. All right. You too. You guys are awesome. Thank you. You Take care, Molly. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. What an awesome conversation with Molly. We hope you enjoyed it. And we can't wait to hear what you think. Let us know over on Instagram. You can tag Ultimate Health Podcast and Molly B. Sims. Share with us your favorite part of the show. You can either do that in a story and record the show, or you can take a screenshot, whatever you like. Just tell us in some way how you enjoyed the show. Thanks guys so much and can't wait to see them. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash 334. We have links there to everything we discussed in a show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we really appreciate all the hard work. Thank you. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that this year he's taking on a challenge to learn how to surf. Jace, that sounds like a lot of fun and wishing you the best of luck. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.